Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. And if you're a fan of our show, you know that one of our most popular features is called Gone But Not Forgotten, where we honor the talent and legacies of our favorite stars who are no longer with us. Today's show is all about the beloved and multi-talented actress, singer, and comedian, Kay Ballard. Most people remember her bombastic, vivacious personality from TV shows like The Perry Como Show, The Doris Day Show, The Lucy Show, The Mothers-in-Law, Hollywood Squares, and her hundreds of appearances on every talk show from Jack Parr to Johnny Carson, Merv Griffin, and Mike Douglas. But if you think you knew Kay Ballard's work or the extent of her talent, think again. Her incredible versatility was nothing short of jaw-dropping. In a career spanning eight decades, Kay Ballard literally did it all, from big bands to Broadway, radio to recordings, television to the big screen. And finally, the whole world is going to know it. Our guest has devoted his career to film and television preservation and the celebration of legendary performers. He's also a terrific filmmaker. He produced and directed a fabulous feature-length documentary entitled Kay Ballard, The Show Goes On. As you're about to see, the film is a joyful portrait and a surprising revelation. Watch this. I would nine be again. I don't know where I got it. I don't know why it happened. But I think I'm lucky because I always knew what I wanted to do. My name is Ann Margaret. <laughs> do you hear that? That's Kay Ballard. I don't care. Well, she made more people famous than you can imagine. Bad Kay. She says it and she delivers it right to your face. Uh... She's original. She's not like anybody else. Later, later we'll talk. She can do everything, you know. We'll have coffee, we'll talk. She is magic. Now, let's get real here. She's a character. Well, she was good in anything she had to do. She's a protean talent, and she always was. Oh, really? Once upon a time, there was a teeny tiny lady, just as tiny as a girl could ever get. Aww. And she was so very lonely in her teeny tiny house with just an itsy bitsy television set. I really just fell madly in love with her when I saw her at the Bonsoir doing the teeny weeny little people. Teeny tiny violins are playing. We're very lucky that we have the things that exist of her on television where she would recreate some of the things she did. It seems we stood and talked like this before. When you sit down and try to analyze her career, you just can't imagine what it was that kept Kay Ballard from going from here to here. Curtain open, light the light. She should have played it on Broadway, and probably it would have made history. She's had this phenomenal career, and it continues to do so. She still works. You do have senior moments, but it's not so bad. Hit it! This film was so entertaining and it moved and touched me so deeply 
that I just had to invite the man who created it to come on our show. I'm delighted to welcome producer and director Dan Wingate. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Those are wonderful words. Thank you very much. Dan, as you know, I absolutely loved your film because you brought out so much about Kay Ballard's career that I was totally unaware of, even though I was a big fan. You've referred to her as the greatest star we hardly knew. Why didn't the public know more about her body of work? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with when she came up in the business, because there were a lot of performers from that time that started on the stage. And then as that was winding down and and radio and television were starting to dominate as the primary mediums, they sort of migrated over there. Kay stayed on the stage pretty much, did occasional television appearances, but they weren't that often. You know, it was mostly nightclub work and work on the stage. And of course, that doesn't get you nationally known. And then the television work is often what people remember, because that's what gets repeated, like the mothers-in-law and things like that. But so many of of Kay's contemporaries, as well as as herself, had these long careers before television came along, you know, and so it, it's it's always uh, interesting to me to try and go back and find whatever we can that's been saved because it's just as much of a revelation to me, you know, and it's, and it's great to be able to preserve these performers at different ages as well, because television also tends to, you know, brand them at a specific point and we always remember them that way. And so it's always good to have something different to show their versatility, you know, give, give a little more info. Tell us about your friendship with Kate Ballard. I understand you met her when you were producing the TVD set of her TV series, The Mothers-in-Law, correct? Yes, that's right. And she, you know, lives in Rancho Mirage. And so as a part of that, I went down there and visited her. And we did a couple of interviews, you know, just audio interviews. And, and we just hit it off. You know, I think the thing... Another thing about performers that are at that particular point in their career, it means a lot when someone actually listens to you and and actually pays attention to what you're saying. Because oftentimes when you get to that point in your career, people view you strictly as a commodity. And like if you're not or Quran or whatever, they're not as interested in you, you know, and, and that's hard on a performer, you know, to, to have invested that much work in their career and then kind of be dismissed later on. It's something that we kind of do in this country more than they do in England and some of the other places. So it's just, it's always, it's always good for me to, to get a chance to talk to those people and let them know how much we enjoy them. It means so much to them. You know, people assume that they hear it all the time, but they don't necessarily. So that was the beginning right there. And we just, it sort of bloomed. I had some friends that moved down there and over the years, I would just always visit her and we would always go, you know, eat and, you know, and, and have a good time and tell all show business stories. And that was sort of our bond was our love our mutual love of show business. And of course she loved, that was her, that was the love of her life was, was the stage. She absolutely loved show business with all her heart. It's very clear from the documentary that she had a vibrant, vivacious personality. She was incredibly funny. She truly was beloved by everyone in show business, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she was. And she was a, she was a helper, you know, and these, these people are so needed. That was another thing that was important to me in in telling the story to demonstrate the ways that she held her hand out to other performers at certain times when they needed, you know, a leg up or whatever needed help. This is, this is a tradition of show business that really doesn't get talked about anymore. It used to be a big part of it, you know, that sort of like putting our stamp of approval on you and, and bringing you forward and bringing you along this kind of thing. You know, we just, we don't have that in the same way anymore. You know, there's an indication in the movie that Kay's mother was less than supportive of her show business aspirations. How do you think that affected her? Well, I think, you know, that's probably something that for for girls that were setting out at that time, especially girls in in that world, you know, it, it had only been a little bit of time where show business was even thought of as a profession that wasn't like, you know a floozy profession or whatever, 
you know, and so it's understandable, you know, that that generation previous, you know, the old world generation, because she was first generation Italian immigrants, you know, and so she had her family, you know, they were all there together in Cleveland. And it's understandable when you when you want this person to have a good life and you see the challenges, it's 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 a tough thing, you know, because you you want them to to have a good life, but you also don't want them to uh, suffer. Yeah. Suffer is the word. Thank you. So it, I think it came from that, but she, she used it as fuel. You know, she, she knew what she wanted and she uh, identified that thing very early in life. And she even talked about it. You know, she always knew what she wanted to do. And I think that, you know, she was the other thing about Kay is she used comedy as a deflection a lot of times to kind of play down her smarts because she was very smart. She was all the way to the end, that mind, just like this. And again, you know, smart women aren't always, you know, welcome at the table. They're a threat. And so she learned to play that down a little bit with humor and, you know, how to offset and throw, throw it, you know, when it's too much attention, that kind of thing. But it just... She fascinated me because she was so adaptable, which is really the key to a long career. You, you really have to be able to adapt. You have to you know, go with the winds and figure out how to continue. And she did that successfully over and over again. You reinvented herself. What made you decide to do a documentary about Kay Ballard? Hmm. Well, interestingly, the story is, is that it wasn't my idea. I had actually was visiting a friend out there and came by to visit her. And I, I didn't know about this because I, I wasn't, you know, day to day speaking with her at this time. We were just, you know, we'd visit occasionally. And we had lunch and she said, you know, I want to do this documentary and I've sort of have started on it and kind of da da da. da but I, I, I really want to go in a different direction. I'm kind of I'm not feeling like this is the way that we should proceed with it. So I want you to do it. So basically that was how it happened. And it wasn't something that I was, I was planning to do. So that, and that's the part that was a little bit tough about it later on, because the thing about documentaries is that there's a lot of pre-production involved, much more so than a regular feature film, because you have to do so much research and you have to find all of these things, you know, you don't just invent them, you have to go find them. And so, that wasn't quite understood. So it took a little bit longer to get going, you know, because I hadn't done any of the prep or planning and they were already shooting like almost immediately. So it was a, in the beginning, it was kind of a challenge, you know, to kind of wrestle with how to, how to structure the story, but it actually worked out, I think, because I approached it from the standpoint of a show business story, you know, and the, the show business biographies, you know, that, that we used to see many years ago where they told the tales of these, of these performers as they went through. And that's that I knew that's what Kay had in her mind. You know, it, it was built to suit, you know, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was made to fit her and her personality and her, her rhythms. And I don't think that certain documentary styles would have lent themselves to this and honored the show business values of it. Kay is interviewed in the documentary, which is really wonderful because she tells so many entertaining stories about the people she worked with. And you got so many big stars to appear in the documentary, including Anne Margaret, Carol Burnett, Woody Allen, Carol Channing, and so many more. How did you get these people to participate? Well, again, it was one of those things. I, I had a feeling pretty early on that it was one of those meant to be things because things we just kept getting breaks in that way. I was I, in the in like Hal Prince, for example. That's a good example right there, because I was looking for this pilot film that or this this early film that he was involved with that he directed uh, early on, and it, that was in 1949. And so I got his contact information to see if he might have a kinescope of the show, you know, since it was the first thing he did. I just thought, you know, it's a wild chance, not much of a chance from 1949, but you never know. 
So I reached out and under those circumstances and he replied and said, you know, I don't know about the availability of any kinescopes, but if you want to interview me for the documentary, I would love to talk about Kay and also to write a wrong, you know, which was uh, related to that book that he wrote where he talked about that first experience. And he, he sort of, he had been told over the years that, or, or at the time that Kay had had him booted off that show. And that really wasn't it, but he took it to heart and it wasn't until years later that he discovered that wasn't true. And so he wanted to write that. And I have to tell you that, in the overall scheme of things, it really changed Kay. I could see a hurt that was let go. You know, it was something that she had been holding on to for a long time because it wasn't her character to do something like that. She was all for one kind of kind of gal, you know. And so um, when that got righted, that was really, you know, I could really see that that was like one of those things that she had to rewrite part of that story and it wasn't as it wasn't as sad it wasn't as hurtful because it in in the end the truth came out yeah that was very healing you know dan i learned so many interesting things from your movie about Kay. for example she was the first voice of lucy in the peanuts and she was the one who first had the idea of making fanny bryce's story into a musical and Mm -hmm. she was the one who introduced the candor and ebb song maybe this time that became right. a big hit for Liza Minnelli in Cabaret. They wrote right. the song for Kay Ballard. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. And and that's another example, too, of someone that, you know, she was paying Fred Ebb's rent for, for two years when he was broke, even before he knew John Kander. She, she knew Fred Ebb, and she believed in him. And that's what she would do. She'd get out her little you know, her little bag of coins and she'd throw you some coins over here. Keep doing that. Keep doing that, you know, or write me this. And everybody, like the one interview that I didn't get that I wanted, but we just didn't have any more, we didn't have any more money was Mel Brooks because she had a great Mel Brooks story that I tried to tell without an interview and it just didn't, I couldn't do it. So I had to let it go. But it's a great story about uh, the movie Limelight. Uh, with Charlie Chaplin. Kay was at the Bon Soir at the time, and she had hired Mel, who was like 17 years old or something like that, to write this. She had this idea, but she didn't know how to write it out. So she hired Mel to do it. And basically, it was this sketch about these fleas in a circus. And Chaplin came to see her at the Bon Soir, and she did this bit. And he put it in that movie. When the movie came out the next year, you know, he came backstage and he said to her, he says, I, I like very much that thing you did with the fleas, you know, and then, she, and then the, it came out the next year and it was in the film, you know, and that was Mel Brooks, you know, and it's just, it's so amazing how many people she ran into at the very beginning of their career. And just, and that's why she was so beloved because she was kind of like this, one of those stage grandmas, you know, that's just around helping all the kids get out there, you know, get out there and do your thing. Yeah, she had a very nurturing personality. And I was really amazed by Kay's singing voice, which is really well showcased in your film. I have to tell you, she toured with the Spike Jones band. On Broadway, she introduced the song Lazy Afternoon. And she was the first person to record the song Fly Me to the Moon. Do you think she was underappreciated as a singer? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Kay had the problem that performers like her can have, which is they do they can do too much. And and people like a brand, you know, especially marketing, they 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 need you to fit in a category so they can market you right and so not being able to do all that stuff it's it really suffers and the other thing i think honestly is that her comedy was just so welcome and natural and and i think that it just by nature of she was so good at it and such a natural performer because that's really what she was she was a stage performer you know she honed and you think about a a young performer you know starting out they throw them on 
American Idol now, you know, when they've sang the song twice. But I mean, think about going on the road, you know, for two years touring the experience that you get working with an audience and the actual learning how to how to work with a live audience and the and the feedback and everything that's you, you know it's immeasurable and she got that very earlier in her career which i think really set her off you know Kay recorded nine albums not counting all the compilation albums and original cast recordings from the shows she was in do you have a favorite Kay ballard album dan well, I love the Fanny Bryce album. I mean, I think if you're, it, you know, the thing I love about that is, is that they honored, you know, her big thing was orchestrations. You know, she wanted good orchestrations for her stuff. And you can listen to the overture of that album, which was recorded in 1958. And you can hear the, the same the orchestrations and stuff, very similar to what became, you know, the Funny Girl overture. I mean, it's it's not exactly like, but it's similar in tone and spirit and energy. And I, I liked the authenticity of that album. Yeah. Well, my favorite is a live album from 1959 called Kay Ballard Swings, which yeah. really showcases her incredibly powerful vocal talent. And there's another wonderful album of hers from 1985 that I really love. And it's called The Ladies Who Wrote the Lyrics, featuring yes. some beautiful songs written by Cy Coleman and a number of women. It's a gorgeous album, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. It's impossible for me to pick anything, you know, because I've heard so much now that it all runs together, you know, and I can't even remember what songs or what albums anymore. There's a period of time after you do a documentary, you know, you have to kind of decompress because it's been the Kay Ballard show in my head, you know, for five years. It's like everything relates to it. You have to kind of, you know, but yes, yeah, she did so many incredible. She was such a great interpreter of songs because she she came from that school of I'm I'm going to understand what this means when I sing it you know and if she doesn't understand what it means then it's a comedy song <laughs> now I want to ask you about the mothers in law which was a mm -hmm. really terrific sitcom starring Kay Ballard and Eve Arden produced and directed by Desi Arnaz you actually produced the DVD set of the series that was mm -hmm. a wonderful show and I still can't figure out why it was canceled after only two seasons well, there, there are multiple stories about what happened in regard to that. I think part of it was they were getting pressure to get more African-American shows on television. This is what Kay told me about what she knew at the time. And Julia, which was the, the Diane Carroll series, they were being encouraged to go more toward in that direction and also the loss of the Roger C. Carmel character, you know, and when they switched to uh, Richard Deacon in the second season, I think there was a, there was also a feeling that it had lost a little bit of its steam in the second season because of that. I don't think there's really any way I haven't found any, we found, we went through a lot of correspondence when we were working on the mothers-in-law set, we had access to some of the paperwork and stuff regarding the series. And I never did find anything that directly addressed it, you know, specifically on paper. You know, Dan, I think that Kay Ballard's success as a comic actress was a double-edged sword. In one of the interviews in your film, Kay said that the mothers-in-law and the Doris Day show cast her as a screaming Italian and that she couldn't convince anyone that she was so much more than that. When you consider her incredible versatility, it's pretty obvious that she was very unfairly typecast, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's something that is partly a part of what television does. I mean, it's just the power of that medium itself is so, you know, once you have it in your brain deposited, it's, it's really hard to imagine that person doing something else. And it's a, it's a challenge for all actors that get television. You know, that's why they're so discouraged, you know, a lot of times because they say you never get anything else or be allowed to do anything else. You know, and then I think the other thing is too, 
part of the loud Italian thing was just the nature of the fact that, you know, the primary television that she did at sitcom world were the live audience sitcoms until Doris, Doris Day show. She, that was a one camera show without an audience. So she was allowed to be a little less of that, but, but it was, you know, theater time when they were shooting in front of a live audience. So that was, she knew that, you know, and then she, you know, she was in performer mode you know, because that was the setup that they were in. You know? So I think that had more to do with it than anything, but it's really, it's really tough, you know, with television. It really does burn an image really, really hard. In 2004, Kay Ballard wrote a book entitled How I Lost 10 Pounds in 53 Years. What did you think of it? I thought it was good. I mean, it was funny. You know, it was like, you know, I enjoyed the fact that she, she just wanted to tell stories. Because that was her gift, you know. She was a great storyteller, and a I would real just, raconteur, real raconteur. And the thing is, is that you know she was one of those people. I call them bridge performers. They're the they're the performers that show up, and they're kind of just like the old timers see them and immediately embrace them because they're like, "You're one of us. You're continuing a tradition." versus somebody that's just so new and they're like i don't understand any of that you know this was somebody that was honoring the traditions of showbiz so she got stories from uh, you know she started getting stories on the road with spike you know with spike jones you know and she even before that she would go back and talk to the vaudeville people you know when she was working as an usher she just loved stories and that she was in her element when it was storytelling you know so, yeah, she was master at it. Kay Ballard passed away in January 2019, and you released the film later in 2019. Did she get to see the finished product? Yes, yes. In fact, it showed at the Palm Springs Film Festival in January, and she it, it was wonderful. The audience just stood up on their feet when she was there. You know, we had overflow crowd, you know, and she just ate it up and it was it was such a relief to all of us because it had been you know a long road to get there but it but we got there and she was so thrilled and you know i i wish that i had um i, I got a call from her when we got the best and fest and i wish i had let it go to voicemail so i could have had it for for posterity but no i picked up the phone and she was so happy she had just read it in the paper and she said hey kid did you hear the news? We showed those bastards. And she was so happy that we had made it to the finish line, you know, and, and that it was well received. And so, she, yes. And she, she literally passed away. I think it was six or seven days after the premiere. So it was within a very short period of time. She was, she was ready to go after that. She was like, okay, whatever. I've done it now. It's, you know, that's what I was holding on for, you know, well, so. after watching your film and given the obvious fact that Kay Ballard was significantly underappreciated within the industry because of being typecast so narrowly, I was left wondering, Dan, do you think she was happy with the career she had? Well, I think she was I think she was proud of it. I think she was happy with the career she had. I think she it was hard for her to see some of the others that came along be so much more successful that's you know she was she would admit that that was hard sometimes you know to deal with that she she didn't have that kind of success that she was able to carry her out you know to the end of uh, to the end of it but but overall she always took great pride you know in in her performance and and being there and everything so i think she was reasonably satisfied there's always regrets but i don't think she had a lot of them well, she says in the film that the last 15 years of her life were her happiest. That mm -hmm. made me feel so good to know how much she enjoyed her life right to the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she really got celebrated because she was in a community of people who appreciated her, knew who she was, you know, every, everywhere she went, you know, if it was the post office, if it was here, if it was there. I remember this one time, this was, this was such a great thing. It only, this only happens to Kay. You know, we went down there. I went down there for a weekend to visit a friend and it was Labor Day weekend. And then I went by to see Ma Kay 
And uh, we were visiting. She says, let's go eat. Let's go over to, and there was this, there was this Italian place. She, she had carte blanche at every Italian place in Palm Springs, you better believe. So anyway, this place she wanted to go. So we got in the car and we get over there and we realize it's closed. It's Labor Day. There's nobody here, you know? And then, and so I'm getting back in the car and we're like, darn. And then the door opens and it's the owner. And he's like, okay. Is that you? And she's like, yeah. And he says, come in. And he opened the restaurant and made lunch for us. Just us. By ourselves in the restaurant. It's like, but that's who she was. I mean, that's how beloved she was. Because she really did love people. She did. And she loved seeing performers bloom. You know, she loved encouraging them. She didn't have any children. So it was very much, she got to use you know, those muscles in, in helping her, her little, you know, theatrical children. Well, you just, you just mentioned she didn't have any children. The film says absolutely nothing about her personal life. And even her Wikipedia page has nothing in it about her personal life. That's very unusual for a biography documentary. Why didn't you include any details about her personal life? Well, first of all, it's complicated. And also, you know, Kay comes from a time and uh, a family that that's not what you do. You don't talk about personal stuff, you know, in, in the public that would embarrass the family. You know, that's kind of the old world. And I can relate to it coming from the South, too, because there's a lot of that stuff, you know, that's there, too, about you just there's certain things you just don't talk about. The other thing was and I did try, but I was rebuffed a little bit because we couldn't tell the whole thing properly. Like I said, it was complicated. Kay was a, Kay was a complicated lady and she had a lot of relationships, but she considered that privacy sacred. She considered that something that was not, you don't go out and talk about it. That betrays that love, you know, even Brando, you know, I mean, because You know, it's funny. I did my best, you know, but like there's a moment, you know, in the documentary where she talks about Brando taking her to Fire Island. And she says, and we have a wonderful, we had a wonderful time. And her eyeballs literally get this big, you know, like Roger Rabbit come out of her head. And that tells you all you need to know right there, you know. But it was, she was very private about that. And she, she wanted to, you know, she wanted to honor that privacy and her grandmother, you know, her grandmother said, I don't want you to show your legs. I don't want you to smoke. I don't want you to, to shame the family. You know, that's a very, it's a, it, it is an old world thing that we're, we're leaving now, but it, it was a thing, you know, it was a legit. And also I think Kay wanted an entertainment documentary. She, she didn't want to go into that zone about her life, you know, because it wasn't something that she felt like, she needed to share. That was hers. She gave everybody everything else, but that was hers. Well, can I ask you, Dan, if you feel comfortable answering me? Sure. Was she a happy person in her life? Well, I think she was happy. I think she always wished that she could have done more. I mean, she was always wanting to do more, but day to day, you know, just in terms of enjoying life and everything, my sense about it was, you know, and she was a very private person. I mean, you know, I'm sure there were things that she didn't talk to me about, you know, but my, my impression of her was that, you know, she had, she had graduated to, you know, a place where everywhere she went, it was a party, you know, and she, she learned how to just relax and not think about the next job so much, because I think, earlier in her career that was she was so focused on that career that you know time flew by a lot faster than than she realized you know now you released the film in 2019 and then the pandemic hit in 2020 which really interfered with the promotion for your film have you got any plans to promote the movie now well what we're hoping is that we can, we really like to take it on the road. Once theaters 
open back up and it's okay. Because the thing about it is, is Kay's demographic is such that we don't want to be encouraging, you know, that behavior right now. If it, while we still don't know, we're just trying to be very thoughtful and careful about it. We have a lot of footage, you know, that wasn't used. There was, there's so many stories. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it, it's often impossible in these kinds of situations to really honor everything. You can't, you just can't do it. You have to find things that represent. And so we have things that we could do a little Q and A and, and show some things that didn't make the film, you know, some little segments. She made me take some things out that, you know, showcased more of her vers- versatility, but she felt she had, see, she had this weird, and it goes along with what we were just talking about a minute ago. She, she had this weird thing where she uh, didn't, didn't like to toot her horn too much. And if she felt like you were getting to that point where it was too much love, you know, too much, she'd pull back. She'd be like, mm, mm. you know, she just had that, she had that thing. So she, yeah, she made me, she did this really great um, Judy Holiday impression at one of her later shows. And, and, this was in that later part that covered, you know, the last 15 years. And there was a little, there was a little clip of her doing Judy Holiday that was really wonderful. And I just loved it. But she was like, you know, so you got to do what you got to do. You know? Well, I want people to know that the documentary is available on Amazon. I bought it and I just absolutely love it. And Dan, I want to tell our viewers that if you love the entertainment world and if you get to see only one documentary this year, this is the film to see. I'm telling you, it's really that good. I want to thank you so much, Dan, for making this wonderful movie and for taking the time to come on our show. Thank you for having me. I, you know, and I'm so grateful we're getting to talk about Kay. You know, she'd be thrilled, you know, because we, we mission accomplished, you know, because she's, she's, She's still out there, you know, entertaining them every time you turn on the TV. It's, just, it's great to know that. You know. Well, I hope you feel gratification and warmth within you that this woman who may at that stage of her life felt a little underappreciated, you gave her so much joy. You produced an immortal documentary that anybody, even if they've never heard of Kay, they will love that documentary and then they will love her. You should be very, very proud of yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. It does. I'm, 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 I'm proud of it. I'm, I feel like we did it together. You know, it was like we were, we were a little team and we were going to make it to the finish line and damn, you know, damn the torpedoes, you know. Now that you've made a documentary that's so brilliantly done, are you going to do any more? Yes, there are, there's a couple that, that are being worked on that I can't, I'm not allowed to talk about yet. It's just one of those things. I hate saying that, but it, it is true. But there are a couple that uh, are in early stages right now. And uh, also, you know, the, the, the restoration stuff goes hand in hand with that. Oftentimes it's, it's uh, the more stuff that we, that we're able to locate and and preserve the more things that open up and like hmm, that's the possibility it's the wonderful thing is it's a great time for storytelling right now it's just an absolutely great time for the documentary form you know and to be able to tell you know tell some of these wonderful stories you know and it's very inspiring to young people to to you know see that there's there are different paths you know to your goals and, and you know so. Well, you can't talk about these movies, but when you make them, can I ask you to promise me that you'll come back and promote them here? Absolutely. Are you kidding? Sure, I will. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. It's, it's, Wonderful. It's, thank you again for appearing on our show, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Our guest has been producer and director extraordinaire Dan Wingate, whose documentary film, Kay Ballard, The Show Goes On, is available on DVD and on all your favorite streaming sites. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.